everyone. Welcome aboard the RMS Queen Mary. My name is Danny, and I will be your guide today on Glory Days. What we are going to be talking about is the ship's history. I'm also going to try to give you a general sense of what travel life was like. Uh, our main focus will be that on the first class experience. A couple things for our tour today about myself. I am a returning guide to the ship. I was actually on board for nearly 10 years before we shut down for the pandemic. Yeah. In March of 2020, I was told, hey, we're going to send everybody home for just a couple of weeks, and we'll, we'll see you soon. I said, great. And then three years later, they're like, hey, we're ready to bring you guys back now. I was like, that was a long couple weeks. But it's great to be back. Uh, this is one of the best shops we've ever had, and I had a lot of fun doing it. But honestly, the outpour of support from the public has been tremendous, so we can't thank you enough for being here with us. Um, Something might be catching up. Yeah, come on in and have a seat. And that's the end of the tour, folks. Thanks for coming. <laughs> come on in. Um, let's see. So, yeah, uh, for the tour itself, uh, you, where are we going to start at? If you want to take pictures, you're more than welcome. Please feel free. You can use flash photography as well. Um, you can take all the pictures of me that you like. Okay, those are $5 each. And we'll collect at the end, so I'm going to be watching you very closely. If you have questions, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, my job is to walk, talk, and answer questions. Um, the only thing I do ask of you is that if you have a question during one of our lecture portions, try to hang on to it until we have a break. We will have several breaks, especially when we reach a ballroom or something like that, to give you time to walk around and take, check things out. Um, then if you can hold on to your questions for them, I will give you my undivided attention and hopefully answer to the best of my abilities. Do your best to stay close with the group. Move as quickly as you can between the separate locations. That way we can not only see everything in our time together, but more importantly, so you do not get lost. Um, we are going to take a pretty uh, linear route. We're not going to really be doing anything too crazy. Uh, I just say that just so you don't get locked out in a certain space because most of the areas we will see today are closed to the general public. So I want to make sure we can see everything together and you don't miss out on anything. If for any reason you have to step away from our group, you have to answer a phone call, you have to go to use the restroom, you can't live without Starbucks, whatever it is. Just let me know, that way I can tell you where the next spot is and you can catch up with us from there. Lastly, this is probably the only thing I wanna ask that we do together. You have one of these called cell phone. At this time, please make sure those are set to silence or vibrate, that way we do not disturb each other. Um, and I think that's about it, yeah. Yeah, so before I tell you about the beautiful room we are currently located in, I'd like to start us off with a brief historical introduction. So think of this like a timeline of events. We're going to start just before construction. We will end right around uh, just after the Queen Mary arrives here in Long Beach. So the Queen Mary was originally owned and operated by a company known as Cunard. From 1840 until the late 20th century, Cunard had a deal with the British government to deliver mail between Europe and North America. It's actually why we carry the distinction of RMS, because it stands for Royal Mail Ship. However, plans for the Queen Mary and her sister ship, Queen Elizabeth, would begin being drawn up in 1926. These were set to be two of the largest and fastest ocean liners in the world. Each one of these ships, the work that they could do on a weekly basis, would take a total of four smaller ships for previous generations to do. So, construction will begin on this vessel alone December of 1930 in Clydebank, Scotland at John Brown Shipyard. About a year into the construction of the vessel, it was halted due to the overwhelming effects of the Great Depression, and Cunard goes into bankruptcy. At the same time, the White Star Line, does anybody know who they're famous for? Titanic, Titanic yes. They too, feeling the same overwhelming effects, they are now in desperate need of money as well. So both of these companies, two of the largest shipping lines in the world, are approaching Parliament to try to secure a loan. Parliament informs them they have enough money for one company. And rather than lose one, they strike an agreement and Cunard White Star come together. So they're not only going to complete construction of this vessel, but a ship to follow, which would be our sister ship, Queen Elizabeth. So after a two year work stoppage, it will begin again. In 1934, we had set most of the outer structures of the vessel. So it's time to finally launch this ship and give it its official name. 
Because up until that point, we were only known as job number 534. On September 26th, 1934, our ship will be launched into the River Clyde in Scotland in front of 250,000 people. Now the ship will need two more years to complete, and this will take place uh, still in John Brown Shipyard, but by 1936, everything is ready to go. It is now time for the ship's maiden voyage. This will take place that year between the dates of May 27th and June 1st. The route is fairly simple for the ship. She starts in Southampton, England, she has a quick stopover in Cherbourg, France, and then she will steam across to New York. Queen Mary could usually complete this journey in anywhere from four and a half to five days. But in 1938, Queen Mary, already trying to show off just how fast she truly is, will set the overall speed record for the fastest crossing of the North Atlantic Ocean. She does the three-stop journey in just three days, 20 hours, and 42 minutes. Queen Mary held that speed record for 14 years. Life as a passenger liner will continue on. She's gaining popularity by uh, the, towards the end of 1939, Queen Mary has now completed nearly 200 transatlantic crossings. On September 3rd, she's in the middle of the North Atlantic. She's on her way to New York. She's two days away from the coast. At that time though, she'll have word handed down by British Admiralty that Great Britain had declared war with Germany thus beginning the Second World War. In the middle of the ocean, the ship all by itself, with a lot of tension on board, was ordered now into military tactics. So, the stewards on board were tasked with blacking out all 2,000 portholes and windows. All external lighting was turned off. The ship ordered its passengers to remain indoors, to not give away position of the ship, and she would be asked to use a zigzag or serpentine pattern to make her a harder target if any U-boats were already within the area. On board that final voyage as war broke out were some rather famous passengers, including Bob Hope and his wife Dolores, James Warner, one of the Warner Brothers studio executive, uh, J.P. Morgan was on board, and my personal favorites, the Three Stooges. <laughs> now, two days later, the ship finally arrives in New York. Passengers happy to be off the ship, happy to be back home. The crew members, of course, not quite sure what their future holds, are also in New York. The ship is lying dormant, as they're not quite sure if they're going to use this vessel or not for wartime. That changes within a few months. In March of 1940, Queen Mary gets the call. She's now going to be transformed into a military vessel. In order to do so, first they started with removing things that were not necessary for the ship during the war, including any artwork that could be taken off of the ship. Also, her furniture, her silverware, they even removed the stateroom doors. Now, what was added were bunks, weapons, and other things necessary for wartime. She was also painted over Battleship Navy Gray, from bow to stern, top to bottom. The ship will go into service shortly thereafter. She will mostly act as a military transport. She starts by carrying the militaries of the United States, Canada, and Australia, and New Zealand. She would also act as a hospital ship for returning wounded, and at times did carry POWs from both Germany and Italy. The ship will also, after the war, act as what was called the Bride and Baby Shuttle. Over two years, she made 12 voyages and transported 24,000 war dependents and war brides from Europe to North America to be reunited with their new families. By 1947, Queen Mary's military service was concluded, and by July of that year, she was back into service as the stateliest ship now in being, as a moniker that was given to her by King George V at her launch. The ship will remain in service until the 60s, but by then, due to the rise in popularity of airplane travel, we could not keep up with our competition. By 1967, Queen Mary was forcibly retired. So Cunard was faced with an unenviable position. They can either scrap the ship for parts or hold an auction and hope that someone will decide to keep the ship's legacy alive. The auction opens and most of the bids are coming from around the world are coming from scrap yards. However, one city remains and that of course is the city of Long Beach, California, who then puts in the highest bid of $3,450,000 or by today's standards, around $62 million. So, the ship is purchased, 
Queen Mary needs to make her way to her new home. Beginning October 31st, 1967, Queen Mary will leave Southampton, England for the very last time and start making her way here to the West Coast. They didn't skip a beat either. Passengers, crew members, everybody's on board. They're excited to be a part of the bishop's history and of course, what was known as the last great cruise. Keep in mind, our crew members understood that life at sea can get quote unquote rough. And this was going to be a long journey because this wasn't our typical four and a half to five day crossing. The passengers, however, did not know what they quite signed up for. Because see, our journey lasted 39 days. It traveled 14,500 nautical miles. The main reason behind that was at the time of the final crossing, we were eight feet too wide for the Panama Canal. So they had to go all the way down around South America past Cape Horn. Understand this is not a ship that is built for warm weather. We retain a lot of the heat. And so a lot of our passengers were growing uncomfortable when we got to the, summer, uh, the Southern Hemisphere where they're entering into their summertime. So, some of our passengers left the ship in South America, found the nearest airport, ironically, and then flew to Long Beach and waited for the ship to arrive and tried to convince anybody who would listen that they were actually on board. So on December 9th, 1967, Queen Mary pulls into Long Beach with a trail of pomp and circumstance. There was over 100 independent vessels that followed the ship up the coast. When she arrived here, it took four years to convert the ship, but in 19, or I should say May 8th, 1971, Queen Mary opens her doors to the public as Long Beach's newest hotel and attraction. Now, 1993, this ship was entered into the National Register of Historic Places with Historic Significance. And three things are happening this year. First and foremost, we just reopened our doors after the longest shutdown of service the ship has ever experienced since arriving in Long Beach. Secondly, in September, we will be celebrating the ship's 89th birthday. And in December, this ship will celebrate her 56th anniversary of her arrival to the city of Long Beach, California. So as you can see, folks, we have now been a part of Long Beach's history 25 years longer than we were actually sailing the open seas. Now, <clears throat> I do understand that that is a good amount of information to take in right away. So, while we have a moment to pause, can I answer any questions? Or does anybody need any clarification on anything? Yes. What was the conversion process? You know, I know they took out some of the boilers. And so they took out every boiler on board, which was 27 boiler tanks. They took out one of her engine rooms completely. They took off three of her four propellers. Um, they also converted a lot of her public spaces into either crew member only areas or into storage areas. And then hotel rooms were combined to make them bigger. Because then they weren't as big as we would hope. I think the biggest rooms were covering maybe no more than about 400 square feet. And so that wasn't really going to meet hotel standards. So we had to combine a lot of rooms together. So essentially, oh, probably the biggest undertaking was rewiring the entire ship. We had to rewire from European to American wiring. So we went from 220 to 110. AC to DC, if you will. So that, that one, and that's the entire ship. That includes installing new outlets and everything. So that was one of the biggest undertakings. To remove the boiler tanks, they took the smokestacks off and pulled everything out through the vents. Um, the smokestacks were so deteriorated though, the only thing holding them together was about 40 layers of paint. Yeah, at one point they were just crumbling because there was nothing left. After 31 years of service, they were just gone. So what you find up top are the faux smokestacks. Those have been replaced. Mm -hmm. Yes? They had to add uh, air conditioning as well to every well, room? Yeah, because our air conditioning was just simply bringing in the sea air. Um, so that's why you can understand when we got to the southern hemisphere in the summertime, pumping in that sea air is just all warm air coming into a warm ship. Sure. So adding air conditioning, uh, not, uh, the heating, because the heating we used was uh, reused st uh, steam from the boiler rooms. So we had to put in actual heaters and water tanks, things like that, water heaters, all kinds of fun stuff. So there was a lot of conversion that took place at that time. As well as plumbing as well? Redoing the plumbing too. In fact, we just redid the plumbing again. Wow. That was part of our three year shutdown. 
Anything else? Yeah. So is a lot of this stuff redone then, or is a lot of So in terms of the interior parts, so the parts that we see on a regular basis, most of what you're going to see is about 85 to 90% original. There have been some changes, but they're very subtle, or they don't impact the history of the ship. We try to keep intact the historical aspects. We just upgraded things that would make her more convenient for our guests today. And we'll talk about those along our route. So I'll try to leave no stone no turn for you. All right. Anything else before we uh, continue with the room? We're going to stay in here for another couple of minutes. Okay. So we are currently located in the observation bar and lounge. This is the original first class main bar. This was turned over to third class by the 60s, and our third class passengers would have enjoyed this bar until the ship's retirement in 67. The room itself does take a semicircular shape. You can see that in the windows, of course. Those beautiful sweeping windows give you a great view of the North Atlantic in front of you as you're traveling the open seas. The bar takes the same shape, and as you look at the bar, it looks like a giant beer barrel that has been cut in half, rather fitting for a room such as this. The granite countertop and the metal was added when the ship arrived here. There used to be a wood uh, countertop that could open up with an arm that would lift up over here and a door that would swing open so the bartender could pass in and out right here. All that has changed now and in fact the bartender has to go back through that door right there to get in and out of the actual bar itself. Unless they want to physically climb over, but that's a little cumbersome. Now all the fixtures in here are original. The dome or saucer like features that you see in the ceiling as well as the urn sconces on top of the balustrades those are all original to the ship very evocative of the art deco period because of the usage of indirect lighting which was highly used during that time the balustrade is also original the white metal that you see on the upper level here those are done by austin crompton roberts they are formed out of white metal alloy also known as burma bright something similar to that of aluminum now, he did not title these pieces, although he has chosen to intersperse beer barrels with mythological creatures and beasts. Or as one interpretation will have it, spirits amongst spirits. Behind me, the artwork is original as well. This piece was done by Alfred R. Thompson. It's entitled Royal Jubilee Week in celebration of King George V's 25th year as king. King George is seen to the right-hand side of the statue with the red coats, the medals across his chest, and the white beard. A little further down to the right, we're going to find the artist himself. He is, of course, wearing the vibrant green pants. He has a large boutonniere on his chest and the white hat. Now, two interesting facts about Mr. Thompson. First, his paintings centered around the theme of music, which is interesting considering that Mr. Thompson was born deaf. So he could not hear the music, but easily displayed it in his artwork. Secondly, he is the last known artist to be awarded a gold medal for fine arts in the Olympics, when it was still considered an Olympic category. And this was done in 1948. Now the wood in here, there are actually three types. So the paneling on the walls, uh, or the bulkheads, is what's called cluster maple. On the bar, we're gonna find a Macassar or Macassar ebony. And there are bands on both sides that stretch across the paneling that intersect about every two to three feet. You can see them here as well as here. Those thin bands are laid in a wood called cedar ma, which is a cross-pollination of cedar and mahogany. That is very unique considering that cross-pollination only happens naturally in the wild every 150 years. So this is probably some of the most rare wood you're going to find on board the ship. Now you may have, oh, I should say, one other thing that has to, probably the biggest change and this is what we're going to find to be the biggest change on board the entire ship, and it's all flooring. The flooring in here has changed, so it wasn't carpeted. In fact, this was a cork rubber surface known as corkoid or rebullion. You would have found this on most of the interior deckings of the Queen Mary. It was chosen for two reasons. One, it's less slippery when wet, and two, it's a lot easier cleanup if anyone was to have a emergency evacuation. <laughs> so we're going to find that same kind of material laid out all through the ship at that time. But because it was such a hard surface and a lot of these areas are open, it would create a lot of echo today. So to dampen that sound, we've added carpet through most of the ship. Now the room might look a little familiar to you. 
It's because it's been seen in such films as The Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio. It was recently used for a film uh, called Being the Ricardos with Nicole Kidman and Javier Bardem. You also see, saw this in He's Just Not That Into You with uh, Jennifer Aniston and uh, Scarlett Johansson. We also saw this used in Being John Malkovich with John Malkovich, of course, and several other films and TV shows. Queen Mary has sort of become like a floating movie studio over the years. But this bar is set to go back into service very, very soon. I wish I had an exact date, but I'm not entirely sure. However, keep checking back and make sure that you make this a stop when it's fully open once again. We got a few extra minutes, folks, so I want to give you that time, a chance to walk around, take some photographs, make sure you stay in the room itself. On starboard side and port side, we're going to find pictures taken of the room when she was still in service. You can take a look at those as well. Any questions, just come see me, and we'll move on in just a few minutes. <coughs> That's more or less like a trick. Um, so, no, not the original. But we've kind of done similar to that on the upper deck. In London, served as the first class social area and shopping center for our first class passengers. This is where they could come and socialize and, of course, spend their money. The room itself, very little change made to it from when the ship first sailed in 1936. Again, it's simply just the flooring, really. So, the flooring used to be that cork rubber surface we talked about. But, we have replaced it with a linoleum, although the pattern is very close to the original. Uh, the reason for the cork rubber surface in this area was because oftentimes we would face waves that could reach as high as the windows just outside. Those are 65 feet above the water line. Sometimes those massive waves smack against the side of the ship and even crack those windows. So, keeping this area protected with that surface was rather important. Now, the room itself, uh, these, all these shops were used at one point while the ship was in service. The shape and the size of them have not changed, just their purpose. So we're gonna kinda go around the room now and talk about what each of them are. The first shop here on the starboard side, the front shop, was originally the W.H. Smith & Sons Bookshop. They're sort of like a, what we would consider Barnes & Noble today. Uh, W.H. Smith & Sons is still around. They can be found in a lot of airports as well as train stations. Now behind that starboard shop, we originally held the drawing room. That was popularized by the ladies on board. They were going to have an after-dinner cigarette, or maybe just chat with the gals, whatever it may be. We've done that there in the drawing room. It was a play on words, meaning you wanted to withdraw from the Centerline Boutique held our Austin Reed Men's Clothing Store, which was a high-end men's clothing store at that time. They did travel with an onboard tailor, so gentlemen found something that didn't quite fit, they would custom make it for you right here on board. That will house one of our gift shops once we open it. Above that center shop, we're going to find what's called a freeze. A freeze is typically a decorative band found on the tops of buildings or walls. This freeze is 50 feet in length. It's entitled Sport and Speed, done by Maurice Lambert. It is uh, molded out of plaster. It is then pressure wax treated to give the illusion that it has been carved in ivory. The Portside Marketplace Hotel houses our only functioning gift shop at the moment. Originally held the first class library. So if you didn't want to buy a book on board, but you want to rent one, stop right there and you can rent one on your voyage during that time. This front shop here would have housed our first class tobacco shop and candy store. Although that has since left, we're not quite sure what we'll be using the shop for, but uh, there has been whispers that this could turn into a vintage candy store as well. The lighting track is also original to the room. As you can see, it's also using indirect lighting. The track itself is 250 feet in length and at one time housed over 520 bulbs. Now it's all LED lighting throughout. We actually have um, a light board where we can change the light to fit different events on board, change the colors in there. Another thing that is original is this piece here, which is five feet in diameter, weighing 500 pounds. Probably give you to step off the target, sir. <laughs> um, now, another thing I do want to point to is the medallion. The medallion you see there is a replica of the original. The, the medallion was originally done by an artist named Lady Hilton Young, who was known for doing war memorials and statues. That medallion has since been given to the royal family. Uh, also what was added was the leather paneling on the walls. There used to be a dark walnut that was found on these walls. 
that kind of brought down the almost the entire lighting in the room was a lot darker, a lot more of a somber kind of feel. After the war, they really wanted to brighten things up and to get her back into service as quickly as possible, rather than change the wood, just cover it with leather paneling. So you can imagine this paneling has probably been on board since about 1945. Uh, this will become sort of like a central hub of, for us when the ship, the ship goes back into full swing. Like I said, this is going to be a tour center. These will all be gift shops. So this is kind of where all the action will take place once we fully reopen. But we are now going to continue. So we're going to head out through these doors. We'll hang left and head to the Queen's Salon. Right, so Those two mirrors are set with peach-colored glass. 
This was meant to combat seasickness for some of our passengers. If you're feeling seasick, look at a little pale and green, look at one of those mirrors, see a healthy complexion, and try to trick yourself into thinking you're no longer seasick. Mind over matter, I guess. Something not grammar means, so it's all you can come up with. The stage right by us is where we house all the performances. I can say to say that one of somebody that did perform here was Bob uh, Hill. Now you may have recognized it when we walked in because it has been seen in such shows as the aviator. We also use this in the natural with Robert Benford, Godfather 2 without Pacino, or recently the you know, Ricardo still in here, as well as a movie called Amsterdam, Margot Robbie and uh, what's his name? Christian Bale. I actually worked on that film. I was uh, locations for the ships. So I was like right here where they were filming. Um, and then uh, more recently, TV shows like American Idol and Brooklyn Nine-Nine filmed in here. Uh, but now that we've sort of gotten into the full swing of things, Queen Mary does rent out all of her ballrooms for private events, so you can house an event in here, a reception, a wedding, you name it, and you will house it in this room. And then we can either use it for our own public events or make it part of daily attractions. Folks, we have a couple of extra minutes if you want to explore a little bit or take some pictures. Any questions, please let me know. We'll continue on shortly. There's a diagram in the middle that I'll be referencing to. This, of course, is to not only talk about the classes on board, but of course our prices as well. So, classes on board were laid out by smoothness of ride. The big blue area you see in the middle, the largest area and the smoothest ride we could offer, that's all first class. Second class is found back here in the stern at the back end of the ship. It's where they had to deal with the vibrations and some of the engines and propellers. In fact, right past this picture here of the Liberace, you'll find the beginnings of second class. Third class is in the yellow at the bow or the front, where they had one of the roughest rides on board. Keep in mind, we talked about 65 foot tall waves. At the bow, you're the first to go over and the first to come back down. And up and down. It's going to be a fun ride over five days. Now, Queen Mary was also known to roll. She had an incredible roll from port to starboard like this. Her nickname was the Rolling Mary. The average roll of the ship was 20 degrees per side. So picture that also happening over a five day span. But let's talk about just how much you're gonna be paying to travel through those kind of conditions. For two tickets round trip 1936 in our first class areas, those are valued at $1,070 American. Today, that would be $22,500. So maybe that's a little too much for you because I know this me. Let's try second class. Back here in second class, those two tickets would have been $550. Today, $12,000 to $15,000. Still a little too much. Let's try third class. Maybe we'll get a cheap deal there. Two tickets there in 1936 were about $335. Today, that would be nine dollars to $10,000. So, if you're anything like me, you were just trying to get a job on board. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to afford traveling. Anyway, uh, just some quick dimensional things about the ship. She's 1,019 and a half feet long. She's 118 feet wide. From the keel or the bottom to the top of the forward smokestack, she's 185 feet tall. She also weighs in at 81,237 gross tons. If you were to take Queen Mary and stand her on her stern straight up and down, she ends up being about 55 feet taller than the Eiffel Tower. And she's only about 185 feet shorter than the Empire State Building. Let's head over this way, folks. Follow me.
Alright, everyone, so we welcome you now to what we call the Royal Salon, although while the ship was in service, this was the first class main smoking lounge. This was mostly frequently, frequented by the gentlemen on board, although ladies, you're more than welcome to come in here as well. Uh, the room, let's imagine, what's the big change? Right. Yeah, alright, good, good job, team. So, I'm all hard on the floor all the time. <laughs> now, in the corner here, an American welcome style bar. Just behind you, folks, we have what's called a steward's cabinet, which came complete with a refrigeration unit and a warming plate so we could serve hors d'oeuvres. Speaking of drinks and hors d'oeuvres, buttons you see all throughout the room, like this, these are steward calls. So if you literally didn't want to walk the nine feet to the bar, hit the button and a steward would come and assist you. But I would say this, for $22,500, they're going to do everything but chew my food for me. Now, the buttons themselves are made out of the earliest form of plastic known as Bakelite or Bakelite. So, Bakelite is warm to the touch and also does give a slight resemblance to ivory. So it's one of the reasons why it was chosen. The artwork in here, oh no, let's, before we go to the artwork, let's try the fire. The fireplace made out of travertine. This was the only functioning fireplace on board. They burned coal in here. However, uh, the flue of the fireplace was connected to a smokestack vent behind the bulkhead. So everything you can actually vent through the fireplace this way. Now, the artwork in here is all original. The wood carvings were done by James Woodford into lime wood. And although he did not title his pieces, they do depict either sea life or sea creatures. Both paintings are original as well. They were done by Edward Wadsworth. Now, the forward end, this one's entitled Dressed Overall at the Key. This one on the half end is entitled The Sea. Because Mr. Wadsworth knew that both of these were going on the Queen Mary, he did two specific things for these paintings. The first, he put the Queen Mary in both, the finer off of the horizon. Secondly, if you've noticed that there are lighthouses in both paintings, near the lighthouses you're going to find two flags on either ropes or poles. Those flags are part of the International Signal Code flags, and they represent Echo and Whiskey, or EW for Edward Wadsworth, and that's how he autographed his paintings. The wood in here is also original. The, the corners, you're going to find what's called a plain brown oak. However, in between, like the paneling here, just above the, the carving, that's known as tiger's oak or tiger's head oak. That's because within the grain, you're going to find what's called, uh, what's gonna, you're going to find what looks like different shapes and sizes of what appears to be tiger's heads. This is actually one of my more favorite woods on board the ship. Uh, but we talked briefly uh, while we were inside the main, or inside the observation bar, about the ship's World War II history. I do want to expand a little bit on that while we still have some time together. So throughout the war, the Queen Mary made 72 successful wartime crossings. She traveled 600,000 nautical miles, and she transported close to 1 million troops during that time. The Queen Mary would also set a record for the most people on one vessel in a single crossing, a record we still hold to this very day. July of 1943, over a five-day span, we carried on board 16,683 souls. Queen Mary's capacity usually held about 3,200. Now, the ship was painted Battleship Navy Gray and moved at an incredible rate of speed during that time. The top traveling speed of our vessel was 34 knots, that's roughly 37 miles per hour. And around that time, she was considered the fastest thing in the open ocean. A lot of Indian captains could not keep up with the ship. They said she was like a graveyard spirit. She'd just be here one minute and then gone the next. So it ultimately led to the ship's nickname throughout the war as the Grey Ghost. But it's really no wonder, with all of her capabilities, why Adolf Hitler put out a $250,000 bounty and the highest honor in the German army to any submarine captain that could find the ship and successfully sink it. To see a bounty that he was able to capture. Now, it was also Churchill himself who said that with the work of Queen Mary and her sister ship, Queen Elizabeth, they successfully shortened the Second World War by at least two years. Now, throughout her lifetime, the ship did celebrate over 30 captains on board. This was done for two reasons. One, they never wanted any one captain to ever think that this was his ship. Queen Mary is the flagship of the Cunard Line. So nobody can lay claim to her. Secondly, 
Mark Twain wrote that in order to be considered a true captain within the ranks of the Cunard, you had to have at least 10 years of experience. So, a lot of the individuals who took our helm were doing so at the end of their careers. Our first captain was Commodore Edgar Britton. The final captain of the ship was John Treasure Jones. It's a rather fitting name. In fact, Mr. Jones brought the ship from Southampton to Long Beach on the final crossing. When Queen Mary arrived in Long Beach, and Mr. Jones handed up the paperwork and the uh, ownership had officially transferred, he summed up Queen Mary by simply stating this. She breathed. She had character. She had personality. She was above all else the closest ship ever to be a living being. I tend to agree with his words, but then again, I might be a little biased. But it's true about the Queen Mary. She has a heart. She has a soul. She has an incredible story to tell. She has survived the Depression, a World War, a scrapyard, and now a pandemic. She definitely makes a mark on anybody who sets foot on her deck. She will grab you by the heart and never truly let go. But a ship with all of its mechanics and engineering and artwork is fine by itself. What truly drives a ship are its passengers. Folks, whether you know it or not, you're the reason why we've been here for 56 years. You're the reason why we hope to continue to be here for at least another 56. Just your interest in the ship alone is what helps us drive us on a daily basis. And honestly, we can't thank you enough for that. But, sadly enough, our time together has now come to an end. We have reached the end of the Glory Days historical tour right here on board the ship. I thank you all for taking the trip with me this afternoon and early evening. Now from here, there's very limited that's left open on board the ship. You can still wander the promenade deck. You can go visit some of the interior deckings as well. Uh, although Chelsea's is open for dinner. So if you're looking for a dinner spot, Chelsea's is open. And you can go there now. I'm sure they won't be too busy tonight. It is a Monday evening after, after all. Uh, if you'd like to exit the ship and head on home or to your next destination, you can do so by continuing down the deck using the outside elevators down to level one. And that will put you on the street level. From there, you can head on home or wherever you're going next, but whatever you do, folks, please do so safely, because guess what? We want to have you back in the future. If you have any other questions, need any other directions, anything else, whatever it may be, don't be shy to ask. I'm going to hang out here another couple of minutes, so you can eyes, you and I can always just sit back and chit chat. But again, folks, if you enjoyed my tour, my name is Danny, and if you didn't, Tell them my name was Bill. Thanks for coming on board, folks. We'll see you again soon. Have a great day, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. Is this boat actually still floating? Yes. It's actually floating. And you can tell by the changing gangways, it's very high and low tide. Mm -hmm. A great job. Thank you. I appreciate that.